appoints his high priest men who have weakness. But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. I thank you, Lord, for coming to the cross, for dying that we might have forgiveness of our sin. And I thank you, Lord, for being that better covenant, that better bridge to reconcile us to a just, righteous, holy, pure God. Almighty God, we now stand because of what you've done. We can stand before him, reconciled, reunited in a relationship with him. Lord, I pray you help everyone to understand that this morning. I pray as I preach this message, you help me get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit preach it, Lord. That he would exalt and lift up the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray everyone would have clarity of understanding how important a matter this is. That you are the better bridge. You matter of fact, you're the only bridge. Lord, have your will away in this message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. Now the role of the religion, please. Has always been an important position. Moses designated his brother Aaron as the first high priest. And uh, the Jewish leaders kept meticulous records as far as their genealogy was concerned, because you had to be sons of Aaron to come down into the priesthood. They kept meticulous records. Uh, since the temple, until the temple was destroyed in Roman AD in, uh, in, in Rome in AD 70, there were 85 different men who served as the Jewish high priest. And there hasn't been a high priest in the temple. Uh, so, well, since the temple was destroyed, we have that, the Jews have not had a high priest. In Roman Catholic Church, there are roughly 350,000 uh, men excuse me, who serve as priests around the world. As I mentioned earlier, the only priest we need right now is the perfect priest, Jesus Christ, Son of the Almighty God. That's because he's the only priest qualified to serve as a mediator between man and God. First Timothy uh, 2 5 says, For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So in this message, I want to look at the similarities of a bridge to how God, how Jesus Christ is our bridge to God. Now, the first thing about it is I need a bridge because my sin has separated me from God. God created you to have a personal, loving relationship. We see this in the way he treated Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis, we read God placed him in a beautiful garden, and he told him to enjoy the creation, and he walked and talked with him. Can you imagine walking and talking Creator on a daily basis. Oh, I mean, I just, I mean, they, they really had it made in the Garden of Eden. And they were told only not to do one thing to avoid eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, and Adam and Eve felt no shame because they'd always been obedient to God. They had avoided the one thing that kept that relationship wonderful. But then sin entered and ruined them. They became selfish and disobeyed God. They lost their innocence. They lost their sweet fellowship with the Creator. Sin separated them from God. Now, the same happened to all of us. I don't want to pop you a bubble this morning, but we are all born sinners. Every one of us have a sin nature. We are born with that. That cute little baby, as cute as that little baby is, that baby is going to be born with sin nature. All right? It's passed down from Adam. Now, the baby is safe until it reaches the age of accountability. I'll say more about that in a minute. But it still has a sin. You don't have to teach that baby how to sin. You don't leave it. Wait till it gets about two years old, put it in a room with another two year old and one toy. Okay? And they'll figure out what to do to sin. <laughs> It'll come natural to them. We have it as part of our DNA, and it, so we are sinners, sinners by birth and sinners by choice. And I need that bridge because I've been separated. Their sin separated from God. That's all happened to us. The Bible says, but your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear from your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perversity. Isaiah 59. Now, to illustrate this, we put a drawing up on the screen. Notice on the left-hand side of this great chasm, you've got man. On the right-hand side, you have God. God. Sin separates man from God. That's, you can't get to it. There's a great chasm between us. So we've got to find a way to get from this side to that side and be reconciled to God. Hang on to that picture in your mind and we'll see it again a little bit different. Uh, that, listen, this might not alarm you because you may be that rare person that thinks, I don't believe in God and I don't want to have a relationship with Him. 
but it's important to note there are dangerous consequences. Dangerous consequences of our sin. God is holy, pure, just, and righteous. And he cannot leave sin unpunished. The Bible says because of our sin, we're going to bad payday. For the wages of sin is death. You may be thinking, well, I'm sinning and I'm not dead yet. Well, it's not talking about physical death. It's talking about separation from God. Not being able to come into the presence of God. Do you realize right now a sinner cannot come into the presence of a holy God unless he comes confessing his sin and repenting? And I say to people all the time, the Lord says, well, I prayed God heard my prayer. No, he didn't. You're not his child. You're not his child. Now, when you pray that sinner's prayer and ask him for forgiveness, after that, every prayer you ever pray is heard. And God knows it before you even pray it. And he just wants you to agree with it. Amen? Amen. And that great chasm is there. I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about spiritual death. Separation that places you forever outside of the presence of God. Eventually in a place called hell. Humanity has been trying to fix this problem ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. That's why they built, that's why they made clothes out of people. To try to be reconciled to God again. There's all kinds of ways people have been trying to reconcile this problem. Human beings are trying to connect with their creator. The Jewish people were chosen by God to share the message of his blessing to all nations. And he gave them the law of Moses to teach them how to live here on the planet Earth. But they became so enamored by the law that they thought it was also a way to go to heaven. The Old Testament law was like an old bridge. I want to talk to you about this old bridge. And I will draw some parallel between the bridges we have today. The old bridge, the law, was literally, listen to me, worthless. As far as salvation was concerned, it was worthless. The Bible says, for on the one hand, there is a knowing it from the former commandments because of its weakness and unprofitableness. The law wasn't a total waste in that it gave the Jewish people a moral standard to live by and, uh, and, and to live in communities and have societies and gave them that. Uh, but it was not, listen, it didn't do good enough. Works, it wouldn't span that gap. In other words, it was a yearly thing. And people have been building all kinds of bridges. There's a bridge of religion, but that falls short of the glory of God. There's a bridge of goodness, but that falls short of the glory of God. Let me give you three reasons why obeying the law was useless as far as... And we're talking about as far as salvation is concerned. I didn't say it wouldn't make you a better person. It will. But as far as salvation is concerned, it wasn't worth it. First of all, it was congested with hundreds of rules. The problem with old bridges we have nowadays is that there's always a traffic jam on some of these old bridges. <clears throat> have you ever been in a traffic jam? One of the most congested places I know of is Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah. <sighs> I go to Charlotte once a year for a, uh, a uh, apologetics conference, and I can tell you those, those interstates going around Charlotte during morning rush hour and evening rush hour, it, draw, it, it, it moves to a slow, slow crawl. That's the end of it. I mean, you just inch yourself around. And I get so aggravated with that's the problem with the old bridge of the law. There were over 600 written commandments crowding that bridge. And in addition to that, the Jewish leaders had added other moral law, uh, oral laws to it. And all these rules and regulations cluttered up the bridge and slowed the moral traffic to a crawl. Then a standstill. So the old bridge was useless. Number two, the cost of the toll was too high. This bridge had to toll to it. Because, listen, many cities have toll bridges where they require a free fee to drive on it. Uh, Joy and I used to go to, uh, where did we go? Milford, uh, Delaware. And we'd have to cross the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. Oh. How many of you been across that? Oh, yeah. That's fun. Yeah. Y'all seen Joy the first time she went across it. And she was driving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it was straight because I think she kept her eyes closed. <laughs> But she made it. But you had to pay a toll to go across that bridge. And if you, listen, if you have to go across the daily, all that can add up to a lot of expense. The old bridge of the law had a toll too. Too high for ordinary people to pay. The cost was sinless perfection. You had to be absolutely perfect to cross this separation from God in the Old Testament law. 
And if you kept 99 out of 100 laws and you broke just one law, then you're guilty as if you had broken them all. It wasn't a scoring operation. It was a pass or fail test. You broke one law, you failed. Couldn't go. Got through the law. You know, so you might ask this. this once you failed, you out. Number three, it never reached its destination. The bridge of the law never reached its destination. Listen to me carefully. The law never reached the destination of bringing a man or woman into fellowship with God. And you might be saying, well, if that's the case, why did God institute the entire temple priest sacrifice thing? And that's a legitimate question. God gave the old system to teach them that it wouldn't work and they needed a new system. He let them build the old bridge of keeping the law to let them discover themselves they needed a new bridge. The Bible says the old system, the bridge under the law of Moses, was only a shadow, a dim preview of good things to come. Those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year, for it was not possible for the blood of bull and goats to take away sins. And I got that from the NLT version. That's a quote from there. But listen to me. The two very important truths in this passage of Scripture. It was never possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Merely cover it up. It was an atonement. But it couldn't take it away. Secondly, the reason they kept making sacrifices was to remind them of their sins, which were never forgiven. Each year it was a temporary fix. It's like you've been so far in debt that you can't pay, so you take out a loan to pay your debt. And the next year you have to take out another loan to pay that debt, and it just keeps going. Back and forth. And it never reaches its destiny. It never brings salvation. It never brought salvation to the Jews. And you're unable after a while to realize you pay off, you can't pay the debt. And you can't reach your destination. I want to show you a picture of a bridge. It's called a bridge to nowhere. <laughs> That's like the Old Testament law. It's a bridge to nowhere. <coughs> Now, what happened here, this bridge was uh, built, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of that river, in Honduras. And it opened in 1998, just a few months after the opening. It was actually a bridge across the river. Uh, they had a hurricane, Mitch, and it swept through the area, dropping over, 20, over 75 inches of rain. That's a lot of rain. The rain withstood the hurricane. I mean, the bridge withstood the hurricane, but the powerful storm shifted the river to another location. So the bridge was no longer needed. So that's called a bridge to nowhere. <laughs> think of the money that was spent building that. And it was only open, I think, I think it said two or three months. And the hurricane came and moved the river over. <laughs> so now you have a bridge to nowhere. That's a great illustration, huh? Do what? <laughs> no. That's a great illustration of the old bridge of keeping the law. It was a bridge that led to nowhere. So how were people saved in the Old Testament? Not by keeping the law. They were saved just like we are, by faith. They had faith in God's plan for redemption. We know God's plan for redemption is named Jesus. They couldn't see Jesus clearly yet, but they had the promise of his coming. They had faith that God would deliver his people. They had faith that God had a better priest, a better bridge to get them to God. The old bridge offered no hurt. No person ever crossed it could go near God by keeping the law. But God, but Jesus offers a better hope. Now remember, what's hope stand for? Having only positive expectations. So through Jesus, we can draw near to God. I'm going to put that diagram back up, but a little different this time. Uh, there it is. Notice now you have man to God, and you have a bridge across that chasm of sin. And that's what Jesus does for us. He allows us to come in through his shed blood on that cross. He allows us to come into the presence of God and be reconciled with God and have a relationship with God that we couldn't reach any other way. Mm -hmm. Not through the keeping of the law. That's, it, that's a great illustration, I think. They had faith God had a better way. The new bridge, Jesus, is wonderful. The Bible says that the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. That's Hebrews 7 19. Another version says this, a better hope, a bridge is introduced by which we draw near to God. Jesus is the bridge that gets us 
into the presence of God. There's only one bridge that can cross that gap that sin created. That bridge is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other bridge. He is the only, he's not a bridge to God, he is the only bridge to God. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. He took care of the sin issue by bearing our sins in his body on the tree. And our response is, we have two steps. First, you hear the offer of salvation. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Then we believe. Jesus reconciles us to God, forgives our sin, faith, and listen. We have a loving relationship with God. And God wants that relationship stronger than you do. The Bible says in John 1, 2, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. A couple of things I want to point out about this bridge. We talked about the old bridge, the law that couldn't do anything. There's only one, listen, remember all the rules that were on the old bridge? There's only one on this one, and it's love. Imagine the traffic jam I described on the bridge. Thousands of cars and trucks all bunched together standing still. Bridge has on, this bridge has only one rule. But like most bridges, it's got two lanes. First, Jesus said the most important commandment is to love God with all your being, all your mind, all your heart, all your soul. The second commandment that grows out of that is to love your neighbor as yourself. You ever been driving along and got stopped by a traffic jam? Maybe you've actually left the head on you. And sometimes it'd be a long way back, especially on the interstate. And it'd be so far to the next exit you could get off. And so you inch along, and you inch along, and you inch along, and after a while, you finally, after you get more and more frustrated by the minute, and don't look at me like you don't get frustrated, because you do. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I will be honest about it. God knows it anyway. Don't try to hide it from him. He already knows it. We get frustrated. Then you turn to the accident, and there are four lanes of open road, and you say, ah, finally, I can go somewhere. That's what the grace of God does. When you finally get through all the rules and regulations of legalism and discover grace, you utter a sigh of relief. Man, I'm glad to be out of that mess. Hello. Now listen to me. I love you this morning. I'm just trying to be honest with you and trying to help you out, give you something, and I'm not going to whitewash it. I was one of those that was steeped. I said steeped in legalism all my life. It started with the Pentecostal Holmes, Holmes Church. When I got out of that and recognized that I, I, I was closer to Baptist doctrine, I found an independent, fundamental, King James Bible-believing church. The problem was, there was as much legalism in that one as there was in the Pentecostal. It's just a different form. It's a different form. And they had all these man-made... This is going out over the internet. I, I know my phone won't ring this week <laughs> from fundamental independent Baptist preachers. But they had all those rules that they had added on their bridge too, as well as love. Women, don't you dare wear pants. Hello. At least they let you catch your hair. Pentecostal wouldn't do that. Men. Make sure you dress appropriately when you come to church. I didn't say I didn't say cover up. I said dress appropriately. That meant coat and tie. And I, when I first came to Tabernacle Baptist Church, let me tell you something. This I think I was in. I wouldn't get in the pulpit unless I had a white starched shirt, long sleeve. Couldn't wear a short sleeve shirt. I'm telling you all this just to say this. This is what happens when you discover God's grace. He frees you from all that mess. Amen. Now, I'm not saying y'all not to dress decently. You got to. That's fine. But decent don't mean you've got to have a tuxedo on all the time. I had a preacher get this church one time. When they wanted to paint the church, this is where I took a little hiatus for a little while in Delaware. And I uh, had a preacher here. They brought him in, and he wanted to paint the church, which is a noble thing to do. But he wanted men to wear coats and ties while he painted the church. Wow. Oh. <laughs> 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 I 
I would go through more suits than that. <laughs> but all I'm just saying to you is we all have that legalistic nature. You see, I ask myself sometimes, boy, this is not an outline. Man. They're not going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, I ask myself sometimes, why do people want to affiliate with someone, something that puts so much restriction on And then I, I came to a little, God showed me the answer to that question. It's a lot easier to do what somebody tells you to do than to seek the Holy Spirit to do what he says to do. And as long as you've got a list of rules, I can check them off. I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, I haven't done that, I haven't done that. God wants you to be led by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think the rule books away. All right? Mm -hmm. Now I try, I, I, do I always do things right? No. But I always try to seek the Holy Spirit's leadership and guidance. Mm -hmm. and, do what, and I've had, I've, I've done things that most independent Baptists would think I was questionable here at Tabernacle. But I've always tried to follow the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. <coughs> now, I had a rule here one time. Or we had it. We had it. Well, I didn't it, but that singing in the church choir, if you were together, you had to be husband and wife. If you were living together, say amen. And that sounded like a good rule. Well, I think, you know, I figured everybody knew that. <coughs> and I'm sharing my heart with you now. So I had a young couple to come in. And I knew them. And I knew her reputation as a strong Christian lady. And they started attending church. And they got in the choir. And they started singing. I didn't say anything to them. I thought they were husband and wife. They sung for about six or seven weeks. And I found out they won't. And she's got all of them met. She's got a good testimony. She loves the Lord. He loves the Lord. They're working in the church. Somebody said, what you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. I said, you know what I'm going to do about it? I'm going to pray and let the Holy Spirit take care of it. Mm -hmm. I started praying. Two weeks later, they came to me. About two weeks later, they said, will you marry us? I said, frankly. And I did. I did the service. Now, I could have made them listen to me. I love them. I could have made them mad, upset them, driven them out, said you can't do that, and they could have left church. <clears throat> but I didn't do it because the Holy Spirit said, let me handle this. Mm -hmm. I'll do a better job than you will. Amen. Amen. Now, I know that's going to get my independent brother and Baptist <coughs> brethren calling me today. <laughs> but that's all right. I can answer the phone, and I don't care if you disagree with me. I'm not, listen, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know how I got on this. But Jesus is a better bridge Amen. than all these laws that are trying to get you to be reconciled to God. I don't have to answer to another independent Baptist preacher or Pentecostal preacher. I don't have to answer to... Now, I do make my accountable, myself accountable to preachers, but I don't have to answer for the way God guides me to leave this church. I have to answer to God for that. That's right. So I tell you what, y'all do what you want to, and I'll do what I think the Holy Spirit wants me to do, and we'll all be happy. And when we get to heaven, we'll all be reconciled. Amen. 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 You agree with that? Say amen. amen. I don't know how I got off on that, but I just God brought it up. I brought it up. Amen. <laughs> Only one rule. Then secondly, our toll's already been paid in full. We can never pay the toll required for the bridge. To God, because the price was a perfect, sinless life. Jesus came and faced every temptation we faced, yet he never sinned. Then, when he went to the cross, he paid the full price for our salvation. If you work with the Port Authority in New York City, I found out something, and retired as a lieutenant or higher, you get a pretty nice retirement perk. You get three tolls for life. Imagine never having to pay a toll again. But we got a better deal. For the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. He paid my toll for me on that bridge. 
The Bible says Jesus paid, or Saul says Jesus paid it all. All to him of Sin had left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Next time you could pull up one of those toll stations or toll bridges, say a prayer and thank Jesus and take the toll for you to get to heaven. And number three, the bridge is completely safe because it leads to God. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore he is also able to save the utmost those who come to him, God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. His mission when he came to on earth was to die on the cross for forgiveness of our sin. His mission now in heaven, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, for me, for you. And the Bible says he ever liveth to make intercession for us. That's his mission. That's what he's doing there. I like that. There are some bridges that are so scary you probably wouldn't want to cross them. Like the Santee Cooper, the old Santee Cooper River Bridge in Charleston, South Carolina. Most of you know this story, but we've got some new people that don't know it. The night we got married, I was in the Navy. And I was stationed in Charleston, South Carolina. And we had to go through, I forgot the name of that little seaside place that's right there. Uh, not Folly Beach, but it's a beach right there. Solomon Island. And uh, you have to go, now this is the, if you go now, they got a big, modern, nice bridge over the Santa Cooper River. But if you went back then, and back in 1972, <laughs> they had one little bridge with two lanes. And it went around this way and that way. And the thing of it is, once you got to uh, Mount Pleasant, that's where you went, once you got to Pleasant, Mount Pleasant, you started up that bridge, there was a point at which you couldn't turn around and go back. There was no other way to go across that bridge. And my dear sweet bride <laughs> that I had just married, and we had an 850 Spider Fiat, Fiat Spider. Everybody know what that said? That's one of the little two-seaters uh, that, you know, you can pick it up and move it when you need to. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's Fiat, fix it all the time. <laughs> so, so, so we go up and start on that bridge and she said, where are we going? <laughs> and I said, you got to go across this bridge. I ain't going across that bridge. No, uh-uh, I'm not going across that bridge. I said, honey, we live on the other side of the bridge. We've got to go across the bridge. I'm not going. Turn this thing around and go to the west. I'm too far gone. I'm too far from here now. I can't turn it around. I said, we have no choice but to cross that bridge. I'm not going across that bridge. I said, do you want me to put you out and let you walk? <laughs> no. <laughs> I said, we've got to go across the bridge. I said, grab my arm and just hold on to it and trust me, we'll be fine. So I think it took three weeks for the nail to <laughs> <laughs> I know. But she dug into it. I'm here to ask you, did she find me like a squirrel? <laughs> <laughs> but we got across that bridge. And she learned to go across it pretty good. Just like she did this at the um, Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. Uh, we went with Paul and Sheila to, <laughs> to Overcoke. Just a little trip. And uh, they told her, we told her, she said, you're going to have to ride the ferry. Yeah, she don't like riding the ferry. She don't like anything. She don't like anything they had to do with wars. I got her out on her fitness cruise in Navy, and that was about it. But anyhow, I didn't tell her how many bridges she had to cross to get there. <laughs> Oh, did I hear about it all the way? What did I do in the way? Heard about it all the way. And she rode the ferry. <laughs> but he never leaves to make it said, We rest assured that Jesus is able to save us completely because he's there in heaven making intercession. That Jesus is praying for me. By the way, it's another reason why I know I can't lose my salvation. Jesus is praying for me. To lose my salvation. You would have to get Jesus to stop praying for me. And the only way you could do that would be get into heaven to ask him. And if you get into heaven, you ain't going to ask him to stop praying. So I'm closing. Jesus is a far better priest. He's a better bridge. By the way, that simple bridge illustration, that's an easy way for you to explain to your unsaved friends who don't know the Lord what it means to be a child of God and how to come to Christ. Our sins creating a gap between our Creator, and the only way to span that gap is through Jesus Christ. One of the songs I liked when I was growing up, I used to like all the folk songs, and Simon and Garfunkel. Mm -hmm. I've always thought uh, 
Sound of Silence is one of the most inspirational songs I've heard in a long time. Mm -hmm. If you listen to it, it's to the words. But they have another one that says, When you're weary, be even small. Yeah. When tears are in your eye, I'll dry them all. I'm on your side. Or when times get rough and friends can't be found, like a bridge over troubled waters, I will lay me down. Like a bridge over troubled waters, I will lay me down. And that's what Jesus did. The bridge of that place. He laid down his life on the cross. Jesus said, therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life and I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Rejoice in the fact that God provided a solid bridge that connects you as sinful humanity with a holy, just, righteous God. What an excellent, perfect bridge Jesus Christ is. And he's the only bridge you need. You don't have to have a human priest. As a matter of fact, you are a priest, the Bible says. You're a child of God. Head bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around for just a moment. How many of you know you crossed that bridge that Jesus provided for you? And that you're a child of God, reconciled now to God and through the bridge of Jesus Christ has made for us. It's a word of testimony. When you slip up your hand, I'm saved and I know it. Thank you. God bless you. I thank you. I appreciate that testimony. If you could not raise your hand, you'd be honest and say, preacher, I couldn't raise my hand. I'm not sure. Well, if you didn't raise your hand and you're not sure, then you need to make it right. You need to make sure. And if you are sure and didn't raise your hand, then you need to quit being ashamed of me. He said, confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. Then I'll be before men, I'll deny you before the Father. You couldn't raise your hand right now and say, preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure of my salvation, but I want to be. I realize <coughs> there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, and that I'm a sinner lost. Would you just slip up your hand and let me come and pray for you? I'll not come to you, not embarrass you, I just want to pray for you. Anyone at all? That child of God. Thank God for what Christ has done for us. He bridged the gap between mankind and Almighty, holy, righteous God. And this morning you can come in the presence of God because of what He's done for you. Would you come this morning and say, Lord, thank you for being that bridge? I don't need another priest. I just need you. Thank you, Lord, for making it possible for me. A sinner, miserable, wretched, poor sinner that I was, making it possible for me to have a loving relationship, an intimate relationship with God the Father. When you stand to your feet, Heavenly Father, have your will away in this invitation. I pray, God, your people will come and give praise to you this morning for what you've done for We need to think about the toll that was paid. We need to think about the bridge that was built. And you did it all. Father, may your people be obedient to your spirit. And one needs to be saved, bring them to the foot of the cross. In Jesus' name I pray. Head your mouth, eyes closed. If you can come and give him praise for what he's done for you this morning, you slip out of front right here. Just come and say, thank you for what you've done, Lord, for making that bridge, that gap that I couldn't get across. You built a bridge across it for me. Would you come? so good to us. Provide a way to reconcile us to himself. Because you see, that's how bad God wants to have that relationship with you. That's how much he loves you. 
no one's ever loved us like he does. Jesus paid it off. All to him I owe. Amen. Amen. I just noticed, I just noticed on the slide we got the new bridge Jesus.